We will start Bullis diseases. Before starting, we want to uh, know what is bulla. Bulla is a cavity forming within intraepidermal or beneath subepidermal and filled with tissue fluid, blood plasma, and inflammatory or epidermal cells. The differences between bulla and vesicle. A vesicle is a bulla smaller than 5 mm in diameter. The lacuna is a small slit-like intraepidermal bulla, like derriere disease and solar keratosis. A cyst is a cavity lined with true epiderms and contains fluid or semi-liquid material like acne cyst and epidermoid cyst. Now, we will talk about the bullous diseases. Bullous diseases are either immunobullous diseases and non-immunobullous diseases. The immunobullous diseases Intraepidermal bully, like pemphigus group, pemphigus vulgaris, pemphigus vegetans, pemphigus foliaceous, and pemphigus erythematosus, induced pemphigus, immunoglobulin A pemphigus, and paraneoplastic pemphigus. So the intraepidermal bully is the pemphigus group. The subepidermal bully is the bullous pemphigoid group. Bullous pemphigoid, cicatricial pemphigoid, herpes gestationis, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, bullous systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, DH, lab and chronic uh, bullous disease of childhood. The non-immunobullous diseases, which are epidemiolysis bullosa congenita, subcorneal posterior dermatosis, haley haley disease, and transient acantholytic dermatosis. The immunobullous, again, is intraepidermal bully and subepidermal bully. Intraepidermal bully, pemphigus group, pemphigus vulgaris vegetans, foliaceous and erythematosus, induced pemphigus, immunoglobulin A pemphigus, and paranucleostic pemphigus. The subepidermal Bully, which are the bullous pemphigoid group, bullous pemphigoid, cicatricial pemphigoid, herpes crustaceans, and epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, bullous systemic lupus, DH, lab, and chronic bullous disease of childhood. There is a slight comment here, the subcorneal posterior dermatosis, we can differentiate it from immunoglobulin A pemphigus by direct and indirect immunofluorescence. In subcorneal posterior dermatosis, it's negative, and in immunoglobulin A pemphigus, it is in direct immunofluorescence, there is intracellular immunoglobulin A, and in indirect immunofluorescence, there is circulating immunoglobulin A, so it is immunobullous, so it is immunoglobulin A pemphigus. But if it is negative, the direct and indirect immunofluorescence, so it is non-immunobullous, so it is subcorneal posterior dermatosis, and anyway, they are both treated with Dapson, best treated with Dapson. So uh, another classification is... Uh, in, of the subepidermal bully according to the inflammatory cells. So there is the inflammatory cells, subepidermal bully with infiltrate, subepidermal bully with eosinophils like bullous pemphigoid, cicatricial pemphigoid, uh, uh, herpes gestationis, and bullous uh, subepidermal bully with, ne uh, with neutrophils like uh, epidermal, uh, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, bullous systemic lupus, DH lab and uh, chronic bullous disease of childhood. Also, the uh, subepidermal bully with lymphocytes like bullous lichen planus, subepidermal bully with mast cell bull, uh, bullous mastocytosis, subepidermal bully with no infiltrate like epidermolysis bullosa and like porphyria cutinea torta. So this is the according to uh, subepidermal bully according to the inflammatory cells with eosinophils, neutrophils, lymphocyte mast cells, and without or with scanty infiltrate. Pemphigus. Pemphigus is a severe or life-threatening intraepidermal blistering disease characterized by acantholysis of epidermal cells. Antibodies are directed against Epidermal cadherins, desmoglyins, which is a family of calcium-dependent cell-to-cell adhesion molecules. So they are, the, uh, they are severe or life-threatening intraepidermal blistering disease characterized by acantholysis of epidermal cells. According to the level of intraepidermal acantholysis, there are two major groups, deep suprabasal intraepidermal and superficial intraepidermal. The deep suprabasal intraepidermal like pemphigus vulgaris, pemphigus vegetans, and the superficial intraepidermal pemphigus foliaceous and pemphigus erythematosus and uh, pemphigus uh, foliaceous. 
Pemphigus group. Now we will talk about clinically histopathology, immunopathology, and pathogenesis and lastly treatment of these diseases. First, the clinical picture. The clinical picture of, before saying the clinical picture, there's a hint on epidemiology of the Pemphigus vulgaris, age middle aged and no sex predilection. Uh, it occurs in Jewish and, and increased HALA H, uh, A10, B, uh, BW38, and DR40. And uh, clinical picture of Pemphigus vulgaris. There are generalized bully, flaccid bully, generalized flaccid bully on normal skin, especially on the face, scalp, trunk, and axilla. It leaves in denuded areas, crustaceans, and it heals with transient hyperpigmentation at the site of denuded areas, usually heals with time. So there is generalized bully and flaccid bully, generalized flaccid bully on normal skin with denuded area, crustaceans, and here with hyperpigmentation, and there is oral or mucous membrane affection in 95% of cases. In 50 to 70% of cases, it is the first to appear. The first symptom to be appearing is the mucous membrane. The mucous membrane affection occurs in Pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans and is rarely occurring in Pemphigus foliaceus and erythematosus. So oral lesion in Pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans and no oral lesions were rare in Pemphigus foliaceus and erythematosus. About the, uh, the, there is two in the Pemphigus vulgaris, the true clinical signs, but they are not diagnostic. Positive Nikoliski sign and positive Asbjohansen sign. Nikoliski sign is firm sliding pressure on the unaffected skin will lead to blister formation or avulsion of the outermost layer, epidermal layer of skin from the basal layer. Asbjohansen sign, finger pressure over uh, the surface of a recently developed blister will lead to peripheral blister spreading. They are rather tender than pruritic. This is the uh, clinical picture of Pemphigus vulgaris. The Pemphigus vegetan clinical picture, early there is vesicles or pustules that heal with vegetating lesions, especially in the axilla and groin, and also there is oral mucosal affection. Pemphigus foliaceus, there is superficial blisters that heals or that rapidly ruptures, leading to disquamation and erythema formation. There is scaling, crusting, and erosions. Usually it is localized, scalp face and upper trunk, and sometimes it's generalized in Brazil. Pemphigus erythematosus, senior usher syndrome, it is as foliaceous, indistinguished clinically from the localized form, and occurs in the face in like LE-like or seborrheic dermatitis-like, and on the trunk, especially interscapular and uh, uh, sternal lesions. There is no oral affection. So this is the clinical picture of Pemphigus vulgaris, vegetans, Pemphigus foliaceus, and Pemphigus erythematosus. As we can see here, the differences between Pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans and, uh, and bullus mephigoid. The Pemphigus vulgaris is usually middle-aged but bad general condition, and the Pemphigus uh, bullus mephigoid, it is old age but good general con condition. We can see also here clinical picture of Pemphigus vulgaris with affection of oral mucosa, flaccid blisters with oral er erosions. Here also we can see the Pemphigus vulgaris and the positive Nikoliski sign. And we can see here the Pemphigus vegetans and the Pemphigus foliaceous with scaly crustaceans and erythema. Here are another pictures of Pemphigus vulgaris, Pemphigus vegetans, and Pemphigus foliaceous senior usher syndrome. Histopathology of Pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans, foliaceous and erythematosus. They are all the major histopathological feature of all variants of Pemphigus is acantholysis. So there is acantholysis. 
the Pemphix vulgaris and vegetans, there is deep supra-basal acantholysis, whether as Pemphix foliaceous and erythematosus, there is subcorneal or superficial acantholysis. So there is Pemphix vulgaris and vegetans, the histopathology, supra-basal or deep acantholysis. There is also acantholytic cells and, as we said, supra-basal acantholysis or bully, and there is the row of thumb stones. Ancient new lesional skin. Occurs in new lesion, of course. And with Pemphigus vegetans is the same clinical picture as Pemphigus uh, vulgaris, but also there is xenophilic pustules, and there is acanthosis, papillomatosis of the Malpagan cell layer, or pseudo uh, epitheliomatous hyperplasia. Regarding to pemphigus foliaceous and erythematosus, there is subcorneal or superficial acantholysis. Subcorneal bully with acantholytic cells. And we can do zinc test or blister smear cytology from freshly ruptured vesicle. We can see acantholytic pemphigus cells if it is uh, deep, rounded. If it is rounded, so it is deep, so it's pemphigus vulgaris. If it is superficial, so flat, so it is superficial, so it is pemphigus foliaceous. There is a nice differential diagnosis here with the Zang test. We can differentiate herpes, basal cell carcinoma, 10, which is deep, staphylococcus called the skin syndrome, which is superficial. So again, the histopathology of pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans, superbasal or deep acantholysis, adding to vegetans marked acanthosis and papillomatosis and, and intraepidermal xenophilic microabscesses. And in the pemphigus erythematosus and pemphigus foliacea, there is subcorneal or superficial acanthalysis. We will see here the histopathology pictures. Pemphigus, there is uh, pemphigus vulgaris, there is acanthalysis, and there is acanthalysis. And there is supra uh, basal acantholysis with a row of tombstones. And here we can see that there is also in the pemphigus foliaceous, there is acantholysis in the granular layer and subcorneal pustule with acantholysis. Here we can see also, again, another pictures of pemphigus vulgaris with the intradermal vesicle and row of tombstones and perivascular lymphocytes here and pemphigus vegetans low magnification we can see the crustaceans epithelial hyperplasia intradermal pustule and edema and for the pemphigus vegetans we can see the Cantholytic keratinocytes, xenophils, and neutrophils within the intraepidermal pustule. Here, the pemphigus foliaceous, also, we can see the superficial intradermal vesicle and the acantholysis. The immunopathology of a uh, 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 pemphigus group, direct immunofluorescence. Of course, they are taking from the perilegional skin, direct immune sources from perilegional skin, normal skin. There is intercellular immunoglobulin G and complementary in 100% of cases. So there is intercellular immunoglobulin G and complementary in all pemphigus group. Adding to that, in pemphigus erythematosus, there is serological overlap with systemic lupus erythematosus. So there is intercellular immunoglobulin G and complementary together with positive basement membrane zone. There is also immunoglobulin G and complementary in basement membrane zone. The indirect immunofluorescence, there is uh, the tetris correlating with disease activity and there is for the pemphigus vulgaris. And uh, there is in all pemphigus group, there is circulating immunoglobulin G, and, uh, G uh, antibodies, immunoglobulin G1 and 4 against uh, uh, desmosomal catarines. They're circulating immunoglobulin G autoantibodies, immunoglobulin G and four, uh, 1 and 4 against dysmosomal catarines. So again, here, the immunopathology. There is diagonal fluorescence, intercellular immunoglobulin G and complement 3, adding to basement membrane zone in erythematosis, perfect erythematosis. And in the indirect immunofluorescence, there is circulating immunoglobulin G autoantibodies, 
immunoglobulin G1 and 4 against desmosomal catarines. As we can see here, for the pemphigus, immunofluorescence of the pemphigus, the direct immunofluorescence, perilegion of the skin, and the indirect uh, uh, immunofluorescence. Here, the pemphigus foliaceous. Also, we can see the immunofluorescence of the intraepidermal immunoglobulin G. Now, pathogenesis. Pathogenesis. Uh, for the pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans, the uh, uh, antigen is desmoglyin 3 and 1. Desmoglyin 3 and 1. For the pemphigus foliaceous and erythematosus, the antigen is desmoglyin 1. What happens is there, uh, the binding of, in all pemphigus group, it's the same, binding of autoantibodies to adhesion molecules, which are desmoglyin 1 and 3 here, and desmoglyin 1 is here lead to loss of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, lead to acantholysis. So what is the antigen? It is desmoglyin 3 and 1 here and desmoglyin 1 here. What happens is binding of autoantibodies to their adhesion molecules lead to lead loss of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, lead to acantholysis. This is in brief. We'll talk about desmoglyin 3 as we know. It's a glycoprotein. 1 30 keridalton protein bind to placoglobin. In the lower part of epiderm, so leads to supra, sub, in the suprabasal layer, so it leads to deep acantholysis. And here, the desmoglyin 1, normal constituent of desmosomal core, which is 160 kilodalton protein, and occurs in the upper level of epidermis, leads to superficial acantholysis. There are, what happens is recognition of keratinocyte cell surface as foreign leads to production of pemphigus vulgaris antibodies that bind to keratinocyte cell surface, leading to production of plasminogen activator, plasminogen plasmine, lead to destruction of desmosomes and reduction of the filaments and lead to acantholysis. So that what happens, binding of autoantibodies to the adhesion molecules lead to loss of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and acantholysis. There is uh, two nodes here. The epitopes of pemphigus antibodies why it starts first in the oral and then it spreads to the cutaneous, mucos, uh, cutaneous or skin. A minotermal of extracellular domain of desmoglyin 3. In early pemphigus vulgaris, antibodies impair the adhesion function of desmoglyin 3, leading to a catalysis in the oral mucosa. And as pemphigus vulgaris progress, there is spread of the uh, uh, O2 receptors and development of uh, the cutaneous disease of O2 antibodies and there is spread of the O2 antibodies response and development of antigen against both desmoglyin 1 and 3. First it is 3 and then leading to oral mucosa and then 1 and 3 leading to also cutaneous mucosa. This is the uh, uh, example of epitope spreading phenomenon. There is another also comment. So, wha what's the cause of absence of oral lesions in pemphigus foliaceous? The desmoglyin 3, the desmoglyin 3 has the primary importance in maintaining the integrity of transmembrane link of desmosomes in the oral cavity. Although desmoglyin 1 is present as well in oral mucosa, but oral lesions never occur in pemphigus foliaceous. Why? Because the co-expression of desmoglyin 3 hamihimal oral cavity, the co-expression of desmoglyin 3 in the superficial oral epithelium. So the desmoglyin 3 is able alone to keep the uh, cells from detaching even if the desmoglyin 1 is knocked out by the antibody. As we can see here, Desmoglyin 1 and desmoglyin 3 in pemphigus foliaceous and vegetans, uh, vulgaris. So, in short, the pathogenesis, the uh, antigen is uh, in the pemphigus vulgaris and vegetans, the, the desmoglyin 3 and the desmoglyin 1, and the antigen in pemphigus foliaceous and erythematosus is desmoglyin 1. Both 
this is due to binding of autoantibodies to adhesion molecules, leading to loss of cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and leading to acantholysis. The treatment of sensitive is mostly by corticosteroids, and there is also adjuvant therapy. Corticosteroids, like oral pulse interleuvenal adjuvant therapy, immunosuppressive drugs as cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, cyclosporin, and uh, anti-inflammatory as daptomethotinamide, gold, and antimalarial, and uh, also uh, immunomodulatory procedures as plasma pyrethrin and photopyrethrin. Now for the corticosteroids, the corticosteroids either oral pulse or interleuvenal therapy. Before talking about, if we will talk about uh, treatment with systemic corticosteroids, we should know the side effects of corticosteroids. The side effects includes peptic ulcer, hypertension, diabetes, electrolyte imbalance, osteoporosis, uh, Cushing features, myopathy, uh, uh, decreased hypopituitary, uh, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, increased rate of infection, and also uh, on the skin, atrophy, telangiectasia, purpura, delayed healing of wound, acne, and hypertrichosis. And also there is uh, uh, their withdrawal lead to fatigue and postural hypertension, uh, weight loss, and nausea. These are the side effects of uh, using uh, systemic uh, high, uh, corticosteroids, especially in high doses, peptic ulcer, hypertension, uh, diabetes, electrolytes, osteoporosis, Cushing, myopathy, uh, decrease on inhibition of hypo, uh, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis and infections, uh, the effect on skin and, the, and their withdrawal. Now for the uh, treatment of pemphigus. Treatment of pemphigus is mainly with corticosteroids. There, uh, there are... Um, there is the systemic corticosteroids, the pulse therapy, and the intralesional therapy. For the systemic corticosteroids, we have three regimens. The first regimen is the high dose. All patients will take the high dose, 200 mg per day for six to eight weeks. This is followed by rapid decrease of the, uh, to the maintenance dose of 15 mg per day as a maintenance dose. So this is the high dose regimen, 200 mg per day for 6 to 8 weeks, and then rapid decrease to the maintenance dose, which is 15 mg maintenance dose. The second is taqim uh, al evidence by. If, if severe, I will give the high dose. If it is mild or moderate, I will give 80 mg per day for 8 to 10 weeks, around 8 to 10 weeks, until all the disease activity is controlled. This is evidenced by no, uh, no new lesions and drying up of old lesions and no uh, mucous, uh, mucocutaneous uh, symptoms. And uh, this dose is maintained until um, 80 to 90 percent of lesions, as we said, cleared, then uh, gradually tapered by uh, 10 to 20 milligram every two weeks until we reach 40 milligram per day. We stay on that for, uh, we will make it every other day and then uh, last for 8 to 10 months. And then uh, I taper until the maintenance dose become 5 milligram per day. So the mild or moderate cases, we start with 80 milligram per, per day for 10 to 8 weeks and then decrease by 10 to 20 milligram until no disease activity. And after that, when I reach 40 milligram, I stay for 8 to 10 months. First, 80 milligram will be about 8 to 10 weeks. And when we reach 40, we will stay to 8 to 10 months. And then I decrease after that to until reaching the maintenance dose of 5 milligrams per day. The third regimen, which is, I think, the best, is... We start... Uh, the patient is initially started by 20 milligram or 40 milligram for two weeks, and if there is no response, double the dose until the response. So these are three regimens for treatment of, of systemic steroids of pemphigus patients. High dose regimen, 200 mg per day for six weeks and six to eight weeks, and then decrease rapid decrease to the maintenance dose of 15 mg maintenance dose. And the second, if 
uh, severe cases. In severe cases, the high dose. In uh, mild or moderate cases, we start with 80 milligrams per day for 8 to 10 uh, weeks, and then we decrease. If there is uh, no evidence of activity, we decrease until 40 milligrams is reached uh, for uh, 8 to 10 months, and then we decrease after that to the 50, five mi until we reach 5 milligrams per day. The third is uh, to start initially with 20 or 40 milligram and if there, uh, for about two weeks and then if there's no response, we double the dose. What about the pulse therapy? Pulse therapy, we should be in the hospital. We give one gram, 1,000 milligram per day intravenously over a period of two to three hours for five days. Megadose corticosteroid. Uh, it is uh, given if there is unresponse to high dose oral corticosteroids. The side effects include there is, uh, of course, it is rapid but short control of disease activity, and there uh, we should continue with oral corticosteroids. The side effects include uh, common insomnia, mood changes, stomach irritation, facial flushing, weight gain and serious side effects like seizure, hypertension, um, severe electrolyte imbalance, and uh, myocardial infarction, sudden death due to cardiac arrhythmia and pancreatitis. With the pulse therapy. So this is the second, second thing. The third option of the is intralesional of the uh, steroid, is intralesional triamcinolone acetonide injection, kinacort injection. Indications, if, if there is new lesion during the tapering of systemic steroid appeared, or if there is resistant areas like mucous membrane. We want to give stress if there is once systemic steroid is prescribed in high dose, we should give antacid, mucogel Zantac, diuretic, potassium syrup, anabolics, calcium, and if the patient is diabetic, we give insulin. Those is adjusted according to the glucose in urine. Avil plus with half milliliter insulin. Those are not as plus من العدد الكل. There is a note also, uh, every day, Treatment, alternate day treatment is less side effects uh, at 40 milligram. I will do alternate day treatment. This is the systemic corticosteroid uh, pulse and the intralesional corticosteroid. What about the adjuvant treatment? When do I give it? If there is contraindication to corticosteroid or there is no response to corticosteroid. What are the contraindications of corticosteroids? Absolute, if there is ocular herpes simplex or TB. And relative, if there is peptic ulcer, hypertension, uh, diabetes, electrolytes, osteoporosis, and cataract. Or if there is no response to corticosteroids. I will give the adjuvant treatment. The adjuvant treatment. First, the immunosuppressive drugs. Immunosuppressive alone or combined with systemic steroid is uh, their side effects usually in fertility and cancer. Examples, cyclophosphamide, cytoxan, 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram per day, and there is also pulse therapy, 500 milligram over 1 to 2 hours, with or without corticosteroids. They are more effective than the oral or pulse therapy with corticosteroid alone and less side effects of oral cyclophosphamide. So first, cyclophosphamide, second, azathioprine, emuran, 2.5 mg per kilogram per day, uh, cyclosporin, a sand immune, 5 mg per kilogram per day, and also mycophenolate, mofetil, salcept, 2 grams per day.